Welcome to the Programming Electronics Academy podcast. Join us as we explore how everyday people are creating extraordinary things in the world. Find us online at programmingelectronics.com. Welcome, everybody. Today, our guest is Mohammed Afane. He's a software developer for Bluetooth, low energy connected devices, but he's also an electrical engineer. So he's got a lot of interesting perspectives. In addition, he is the founder of Novel Bits, which is really the best place to go online if you're trying to figure out Bluetooth, low energy stuff. Mohammed, welcome, man. Great to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. So I really want to dive in, man. I got a ton of questions about Bluetooth. And I'm just going to pretend like I don't really know anything about Bluetooth, you know, to maybe uh, get get some of these uh, answers out. But I feel like I see Bluetooth everywhere, right? Bluetooth is everywhere on everything, on every device. You know, you see that little Bluetooth sign. Right. But yeah. like, what exactly is it? And I know that's a really broad question, but if you want to like, I don't know, dive in at some any point in there and just kind of like school me up on that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the brand, so Bluetooth has been around since the 1990s. And it first was uh, introduced as a cable replacement. So think of anything that had wires, primarily like keyboards, mice, uh, or even just connecting to PCs or PDAs, if anybody remembers those uh, together and transferring data between them. So they, they came out with this Bluetooth with this technology that's supposed to be universal global across different devices from different manufacturers and be able to connect these two devices together to transfer data so that's where it started and then really the audio streaming use case is the one that really got it picked up especially when it started to get adopted by phone manufacturers so that's where bluetooth really took off and became more of a consumer like household name that everybody can uh, recognizes and knows and sometimes hates because of all the connectivity issues that you might run into. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. I was yeah, gonna... no. I mean, it's a lot of this is, is definitely true, and I'll, I can touch on that. Um, it's more specific. So that's the original kind of Bluetooth, what's called Bluetooth Classic right now, or sometimes referred to as basic rate, um, enhanced data rate, BR, EDR. Those are just the terminologies okay. for Bluetooth Classic. So that's the one that's usually used for sometimes transferring files from your phone to your computer, which is pretty, a little bit archaic and it doesn't always work. And then also for audio streaming. So that's where you connect to a wireless speaker or you connect to your infotainment system in your car. And that's where Bluetooth comes in and you can connect your phone. So that's pretty much adopted on, I would say hundred percent of smartphone devices. Now, that doesn't solve a problem for low power devices or devices that don't need a lot of data to transfer because with these kinds of devices that use Bluetooth Classic, they keep the connection on and the radio on the whole time. So that's why uh, like an earbud, now it's gotten a lot better, but before like wireless speakers would only last for a few hours and then you'd have to charge them. And that's because the radio is on the whole time transferring data or even if it's not transmitting data, the radio is still on and draining the battery. Now in 2010, uh, the new, a new version of Bluetooth of the specification named 4.0, the version version 4.0 came out with a, a new protocol. So it's not really connected to, it, it shares some of the things with, uh, or some of the stack levels with Bluetooth Classic, but they're really incompatible and it's called Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, the official name is Bluetooth Low Energy, and even the Bluetooth uh, Special Interest Group, which is the group behind the standard, that's what they. That's what the official name should be. But everybody just calls it BLE. Okay, man. Um, I feel so like you. Become... I feel like you've answered a hundred of my questions already. So this is awesome. <laughs> Let me read back some of this just to make sure I'm following. Yeah. Okay. So Bluetooth is really like the idea is it's replacing having to have a cable. Like exactly. Everybody, I freaking hate wires. Like I just the yeah. other day I. I uh, set up these trays underneath my desk to hold all the wires that come off of my device. You know, it's like mm -hmm. a white, like a, that come off of my device. You know, it's like mm -hmm. a white, like a world without wires sounds wonderful in some regard, you know, yeah. um, obviously comes with issues too or whatever, but that was like the initial, like, all right, geez, we need to try to like not have a wire going to some device. 
what really amazes me though, what's interesting is that the Bluetooth classic, the one that you were just talking about that's so common, yeah. that's the one that's really been adopted by phone manufacturers and stuff is that's kind of the one that they're mostly well, using. Cause every time I hear the, I'll see the classic, right. And I think like, Oh, that must, you know, nobody must be using that must be like, you know, the old one or something, but that's actually really common. <laughs> yeah. I mean that, so I, just to kind of bring it to like the consumer level, if you want to identify, and this is like the easiest way to identify whether you're actually using Bluetooth classic or LE, Usually Bluetooth low energy, the connectivity or pairing your device or connecting to a device using Bluetooth low energy, it would have to, it usually goes through an app. So it doesn't go through your system settings. If you go to a system settings, the Bluetooth settings in there, and you're asked to pair to a device using that, usually, if not 99% of the time, that's a classic Bluetooth classic device. So anytime you go into the car and you pair with a new car and you get those numbers, the six digit uh, numerical confirmation code to pair with your phone and you have to go to your Bluetooth settings on your phone, that's using Bluetooth Classic. Okay. Bluetooth right. LE or Bluetooth Low Energy is a lot more common in small devices that are more personal. So you can think of like uh, fitness trackers, home smart home devices such as door locks there's a lot of different use cases we can talk about like okay. beacons things that happen in the background while like you have a compatible app and it just notifies you when you get close to a certain area where there's a bluetooth low energy device but i mean there's tons of applications for bluetooth low energy compared to classic classic was very uh, and it's still it still exists so it's not really it's still in there and they're, they actually share the same specification document, which sometimes makes it really hard to understand what is each or where, to, if you want to go deeper into the technical details of it. But Bluetooth Low Energy uh, has uh, more flexibility. It allows you to do create and custom proprietary applications and build on top of the protocol. Whereas with Classic, you're really just tied into what profiles are available. So think of like the headset hands-free profile used for your wireless headphones or for your headset. You have the A2DP, which is a profile which is used for wireless streaming of music where you can get stereo sound. And outside of that, there's just a few like controlling video, for example. So you can send like play, pause, skip, or volume up, volume down commands. Those go through Bluetooth Classic if you're playing maybe like an audio from a YouTube video uh, to a speaker or something, and that speaker can control that video. But outside of that, it's it's really close. It's, un it's not flexible for developers and for manufacturers. So that's where Bluetooth Low Energy came in. But it also came in to solve kind of the problem of draining batteries. So a lot of these devices that use Bluetooth Low Energy these days they don't need to be on the whole time and transferring a lot of data. They're not doing streaming applications. So they, you have a fitness tracker, maybe it's recording some st your steps throughout the day. It wakes up and transmits your data connection with a connection to your phone, transfers that data maybe once every 10 minutes. Once, Even if it's once every minute, you're still saving a lot of time of the radio being on. And that's the key differentiator between Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth Low Energy. Okay. I am so glad we're having this conversation because I feel like, like you've just cleared up something in my head a lot. Like, this is great. Okay. So is there anything that Bluetooth low energy can't do that Bluetooth classic can do? Is there like a throughput yeah. thing? It almost, it sounds <laughs> it is, to me yeah. like on the fringe here that it, this is a throughput thing and that Bluetooth LE is more for not heavy data throughput kind of thing. Is that true or is that just... So that has been true since the beginning of Bluetooth Low Energy. However, it is changing now. So there's a new standard. So the primary use case that you're mentioning is in audio streaming. That's the top. Uh, right now, like the top data rate that you can get with Bluetooth Classic is three megabits per second. And that's like the radio rate. So you're, when you add in the overhead and maybe some gaps in the transmission that are required and some uh, you you know you get down to the actual audio it's not going to be up at that high level of data rate however with low energy the highest is two megs right now at the moment but that doesn't mean that it can't be achieved much better experience so 
with there's a new standard called LE audio and that's considered to be the next generation of Bluetooth audio. So that uses LE and it's allowing you to stream data at higher at the two megs. Usually it's going to be used with the two megs. So with Bluetooth low energy, you have different options for the data rate, but two meg is the highest and LE audio allows you to use that to actually stream data that is time bound. So it's data that doesn't make sense after a specific period of time or after a certain amount of milliseconds, whatever. So the streaming of that data happens over LE, but, and that's, that came as a standard and it's starting to get out on the market right now. There's not a lot. I don't think there's any products right now. There are development kits available uh, from companies like Nordic Semiconductor. There's another company called T-Link that has their own audio streaming uh, or de LE audio development kits. But that basically came to solve the issue that classic, sometimes it cannot address certain use cases. So for example, and manufacturers have gone around that and created their own proprietary protocols. But you, when you have a separate earbud for left and right, uh, traditionally with classic, what manufacturers have done is that one of the earbuds only receives the the, the the data, the audio stream, and that headphone uses some other technology to take it to the other headphone, the earbud. No kidding. Um, because the it, Classic does not allow you to stream. It wasn't able to stream the same or two different channels, for example, to two different devices that are connected together and that are supposed to be synchronized. So that's how manufacturers produce, were able to address that. With LE, it's totally changing the game. It's allowing you to do so many different things. Um, for example, broadcast was never really available. We don't think of Bluetooth as being a broadcast technology in terms of audio. When you go into a car or you want to connect to a wireless speaker, you have to go through that pairing process. You have to, and it's only you transmitting that data. It's only that speaker receiving that data usually. So with LE, it's allowing you to do an almost like a local FM radio station where you can broadcast data out to unlimited number of users because it's it's just going on on one channel or the multiple channels, but it can be received by unlimited number of devices because they're not going to establish a connection in that case. They're actually going to just listen to that broadcast. So there's no back and forth. There's, it's not bi-directional. It's just unidirectional. And it's going to solve like a lot of different use cases that we're not able to be uh, solved using Bluetooth Classic. Wow, this is so interesting. I mean, I guess just at first blush, BLE low energy just sounds way better. You know, it just, it sounds much more advanced to me, uh, much more useful. Um, all the things you said sound, makes it sound great. There's a couple of things I want to dive into talking about classic versus low energy. Is it a difference in hardware also, or is it just a difference in protocol? Yeah, it, the, there is a difference in hardware, but it's mostly about the radio, the physical layer of the protocol. So the way that the bits are being streamed out. Um, if, I mean, just to simplify it, it's, it's really just like two different languages, basically. Maybe you can think of like two different languages that share kind of a root language, but they just speak differently. So there are shared levels of the stack between them, but it's, it, they just don't interoperate with each other. Smartphones these days, really, it started out with Apple releasing the iPhone 4S, I believe it was. And that has that was the first smartphone to include Bluetooth Low Energy, along with Classic. Even though I'm talking about LE audio and all the new features, Classic is probably not going to go away for another 20 years, I would think. And in the meantime, there's going to be a lot of manufacturers that are just going to include LE and classic for even for audio, like right now, audio applications or audio chipsets usually just do classic going forward. We'll probably start seeing dual mode to so classic and LE on the same chipset. And that's what's in phones right now. So that's why your phone can talk to a uh, Fitbit and it can also talk to a wireless speaker and stream audio to it because it actually supports both Bluetooth classic and low energy and going forward for streaming audio applications. We'll probably see both of these being implemented in like uh, wireless speakers or like small devices as well. But over over the long term, LE audio will, will just take over and replace. But think about the automotive industry. I mean, cars need to last for like 20, 30 years. 
it's not a classic is not going away anytime soon. And the, the adoption of rate of new technologies in the automotive and some other industries, especially industrial and commercial, it just takes a long time. So, okay, gotcha. All right. Just to make sure I'm following, right. You've been referring to a standard a couple times mm -hmm. and like, I'm not sure. So, okay. When you read the word, every time I see Bluetooth, there's a little circle R yeah. like Bluetooth isn't a company, right? It, can you explain this whole standard? And when, when you refer to the standard, what what do you actually mean? And like, yeah, who like, quote unquote, owns Bluetooth, if that's even a sure. way to say that? Like, is there I, you know, does somebody own the IP for it or something like that? I'm just curious. Okay, yeah. So first, just go back in history, Bluetooth started as more of a a standard that different companies wanted to create, so that they can create this uh this type of protocol, this protocol, so that multiple manufacturers can adopt it, can build upon it, and be able to use their devices from, you know, together. So that started off, I don't know the exact uh, history of that, but that at some point, a company was created to manage that. And that's called the Bluetooth Special Interest Group. So there is a company called, it's not called Bluetooth itself, but it's called the Bluetooth Special Interest Group or Bluetooth SIG. And you can find a lot more information about them on Bluetooth at Bluetooth.com. So they actually own, it's a nonprofit organization, and it's the organization behind the standards that can, that adopts the different specifications, the new updates, any new features that get added to, to Bluetooth technology go through the, it goes through the Bluetooth uh, special interest group. So they, they own the brand, they control how you can use the trademark. So that, that's why it's, it's a registered trademark. That's why you see the R. People cannot use it and uh, just abuse the name in some way. And then even there's rules on how you can use it. And it's only, it can only be used on products and in marketing material and all that by members of the Bluetooth SIG. So those are companies that come together. So when I'm talking about Bluetooth SIG, it's really more of a company that manages the standard rather than participating in the technical aspects of it. So they don't actually, they're actually Bluetooth SIG employees. And actually I was an employee of them for just over a year. Oh, no kidding. Um, cool. Just last year. And they cannot participate in the working group. So all these standards that we see for different specs, different versions of Bluetooth, they are formed and created by a working groups on different features. And for each working group, it's really just members or people who come from different companies that are interested in collaborating and controlling basically the destiny of Bluetooth through their participation and their technical expertise and providing, really defining how the protocol works and any new features that get added and any new specs. So the SIG, Bluetooth SIG only manages those working groups and like they don't control and they're not allowed to say anything during those meetings for the working groups. But they also, the two other aspects that they help with and as they, they standardize the, the protocol and they make sure that anybody who wants to use the Bluetooth logo is compatible, is uh, it can work uh, across different devices. So device from manufacturer A, is compatible with device from manufacturer B, and they can easily work in the market without having to really do a lot of testing between them. Um, it's interoperable, basically. Interoperability okay, gotcha. and being able to do that just based on a standard spec and some test uh, testing that can happen, and then a certification that you need to send your device to the Bluetooth SIG to get it certified and tested, and then you can you get the stamp of approval that you get the Bluetooth, you get to use the Bluetooth name or the Bluetooth logo. And the third part of the role of the Bluetooth SIG is in marketing and increasing awareness of, about the technology and the use cases and the, the different technical aspects of that. Okay. All right. This is so interesting. I'm blown away by the amount of cooperation taking place yeah. just between those members. Competitors. Really yeah. awesome. I'm oh. sure it's like any level of cooperation to that level takes like patience, time, resources. It is fantastic though. Cause I feel like in the end, it's probably beneficial for all these companies. So like, and, and so, and let me say this, you, smack me if I'm wrong here, Muhammad, but it almost sounds like, like I think of USB, right? 
I can take a USB device and just, yeah. I can plug it into just about, you know, a Mac, a PC, a, a Linux box, like whatever, you know what I mean? Or I, I feel like I can use it in many different devices and I got, no, I've got no issues. You know, it's like that set Correct. standard, right? Is that like Bluetooth, but wireless, right? It's kind of the idea yes. there. It's that standard. And when you're talking about these technical standards, we're talking about like literal documents that say like, this is, this is how the protocol works. Like, these are the bits that go first. And, you know, yes. this is like the data package this way, this, you know, and like, first you're going to send, you know, we're going to authenticate this way. We're going to do this way. Like literal, like exactly. a program, a software developer is going to have to be familiar with the standard if they are going to write software that's going to help allow two pieces of uh, code to work together. Yeah, so there's different aspects of that. So the Bluetooth spec right now, the core spec, uh, there are multiple specs, but they define other things like, Bluetooth Mesh has multiple specs. Uh, LE Audio has over 22 specs just by itself. And LE Audio builds on top of Bluetooth Low Energy. So you have the core and then you have 22 other specification documents. Now the core spec is over 3000 pages. So it is not that easy to navigate, but it's intended for as a reference, obviously for understanding how things work, but it's also really the Bible for people who are implementing stacks. So Bluetooth stacks that run on devices on chipsets, they have to follow that by the T and they have to really understand it. There's also test specifications as well where they have to go through a number of tests when they develop a stack, for example. Application developers can usually get away. Like if you're building a device and you already get, uh, you know, you're building a device that's based on a, Silicon Labs or Nordic semiconductor chipset, or even an Arduino, like the Nano BLE33, I think it's called. It's all, they're providing you with the stack, with the software, with everything, and you just get access to the APIs. If you understand Bluetooth, you don't need to go to the spec at all. You just need to interact with the APIs. You don't even need to, you need to certify you and uh, your device if you want to release it in the market and use the Bluetooth brand name. But a lot of the heavy lifting of certifying the low level aspects of the Bluetooth functionality has already been done by the module or the chipset maker. And they provide you with kind of a reference ID that you can use during the qualification process. Okay. Whew. All right. I feel better now. <laughs> I feel. <laughs> okay. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So as the end user of like, you know, I'm programming Arduino, I, th there's libraries yeah. out there I can use. I'm just, okay, exactly. here's my library. And then, okay, that's pretty awesome. Because this it's a wireless technology. They we, there's antennas, right? So the like mm -hmm. into when you, when we refer to chipset, like we're talking about like just integrated circuit. That's like a on on these things, right? Basically, is what we're talking about. And does the integrated circuit itself is the antenna included in that integrated? Is that part of the actual module, or is that like a separate part? Or I'm sure maybe it can be both ways. Or yeah. and I guess yeah, it can like the is the antenna different between or the type of antenna different between like classic or low energy or that, that doesn't really matter. I'm, and I'm like smoking something. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think the, uh, so I'm, I'm not an R uh, engineer or expert, but okay. So just to take a step back, Bluetooth operates in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, which is known as the industrial scientific and medical band. So that's an unlicensed band. So it shares it with other technologies. So really what it comes down to, the antenna doesn't does it matter except for the frequency that it needs to operate, if, as far as I understand? So probably an antenna for Wi-Fi, I think, would work for Bluetooth Low Energy or Bluetooth Classic. I think with Bluetooth, it, a lot of times the devices are small, so you can't really include an antenna, an external one. So they get built into the chipset or even just on the PCB as a trace antenna. Uh, okay. uh, modules, modules usually will already embed an antenna and do the RF tuning or whatever the matching that they call the antenna matching. And so you get with a module, for example, you'll get that working out of a box with no need for an external antenna. Maybe they'll add like a, what is it called? An SMA connector where you can attach like an external antenna. But I, yeah, the antenna is, uh, I think, left to the implementation sometimes or de depending on the manufacturer. Okay. No, that makes a ton of sense. All right. When I, you know, like I, code developed mostly with Arduino. And one of the uh, processes I've been using a lot is just ESP32s because uh, they're just a ton of fun yeah. and they're super cheap. And if I understand correctly, 
the newer ones are also not only can they do Wi-Fi, but they can also do Bluetooth Classic. And I want to say they can do Bluetooth Low Energy, some of them, which to me just kind of blows me away. And I know those the modules, a lot of the modules, it, it seems they they come with, you know, antennas. Like you said, they've either got the trace antenna that's like right in the PCB or now I've mm -hmm. been seeing like these little ceramic. I think it's like a ceramic, maybe okay. not ceramic. I don't know. It's just it looks like a little piece ceramic brick that's sitting on yeah. there. It just blows me away. But uh, let's say somebody's listening to this and they're like, OK, this Bluetooth low energy. The Bluetooth sounds cool. Everybody, you know, it's really common. What if some of the use cases for somebody who's, I don't know, wants to send data to a device? Like, what do they have to be thinking about? Do they have to be thinking about how they authenticate? Like, I don't know. Is there like some general process for thinking about, okay, I've got to make a connection and send some yeah. data? Yeah. So the, in, in Bluetooth Low Energy, there are two main, I would say, modes that the device, or there, there are multiple modes, but you can think about it in terms of, a Bluetooth, there are two types of devices as well. There's something called the central, which is usually like a phone that is scanning for devices, listening for other Bluetooth low energy devices. And the other Bluetooth low energy devices that want to announce their presence will send it, will be in the, they're called peripherals, BLE or Bluetooth low energy peripherals. And these devices are sending out data, advertising data is what it's called. And they're in the advertising mode. And they're sending out data just continuously to let others know or let central devices know that they're around. So you can think about, so the, this is like the first step of any Bluetooth low energy system. It doesn't matter. Sometimes the devices just stay in the broadcast mode. So in the advertising mode, so that multiple devices can see their data, but then there's no bi-directional kind of communication in that sense. Uh, there are exceptions with, later newer versions of the spec where you can actually do a back and forth using advertising, but that gets uh, too detailed. The, the most common is that either you keep your device in advertising mode and in the advertising mode, you can send up to, I think, 31 bytes of data. So if that's enough for you and you don't care as much about the security aspect of it, and you just want to say, for example, you have some kind of uh, temperature and humidity sensor and you want to place it in your in different parts of your house, like you have multiples of them, you can just have them programmed to advertise that data, the humidity and, and, and uh, temperature readings. And then you can pick it up using your phone, using even off the shelf apps. Like there, there are a few apps on the app store that they're generic BLE apps and you just power them up. You start the app and you do a scan and you can find all the devices that are around you that are advertising in the open. So you can connect, you can just read that data without even connecting to the device. It's just listening to the broadcast. So that's like the simplest mode. So if you just want to add some sort of wireless broadcast to a device that maybe is far away or you want to put it in an unreachable place where you can't, or you don't want to have a screen on it. So you want to minimize the size. You want, you leverage the, the UI, the UX of the smartphone, which is everybody's familiar with. And you use Bluetooth to discover that and display that data in a more UI rich environment. Wow, that is, uh, I, I guess like, I feel like I should know more of this, but man, that is so awesome. So like, there's so many different cool sensors out there yeah. and you know, you're putting some calls in there to, okay, so like, okay, begin Bluetooth yeah, and then send, you're yeah. just kind of sending. So you're just kind of sneaking it in there somewhere and it, it's not some crazy like, oh man, no. I gotta, and if I'm following, it's not even you're not even like authenticating with the phone or anything like that. You're Nothing. literally just sh blasting out some information. Are you in charge of how often that gets sent out? Okay. Yeah. It's not like there's a requirement. It can happen like every once in a while kind of thing. No, it's yeah. So, I mean, depending on your application and how much you want to preserve power and lower the power consumption, you can design your device. So I'll just talk about it in like terms of the simplest implementation, and I'm pretty sure the Arduino BLE library, that's what it's called from Arduino, it's probably as simple as this. You power on the device, you go into that main loop, right? Or I don't know what, exactly how it is in Arduino, but you have the application loop. And in there, you just, uh, or, or the main function, and you just start by maybe enabling BLE. And then the next thing you would want to do is actually set the advertisement data. So put some kind of initial data in it, maybe. 
And then you just call the start advertising function or API. And that might take some parameters such as like the advertising interval and the type of advertising. So there are different types of advertising packets where some advertising packets indicate that the device accepts a connection, which we can talk about in a little bit. And that's the next kind of phase of uh, devices, or it can be just advertising only mode. So in that case, you just do that. You start the advertising and boom, that's it. You don't need to do anything else if you're just wanting to broadcast that maybe constant or fixed data. If you want to you know, update based on a sensor, then you can, in the while loop, you can every one second or something, read the sensor data, update the advertising data, and that's it. So it's, it's as simple as that. And any BLE device, uh, any phone that supports BLE, which is pretty much all of them, you can just launch NRF Connect, which is the one from Nordic, or there's EFR Connect from Silicon Labs. There's different ones that are out there. And you can just launch that and discover the device, and you don't even have to connect to it, and you'll see the raw data. So wow. There are certain formats as well to make it easier to, to interpret on the other side. And if you use that, like if you've heard of the Eddystone from Google or iBeacon, iBeacon is usually just for ID identification. Eddystone adds some more like data. And this, these are just formats of the advertising data. And you have, if you have a, an iPhone application or Android application that recognizes that format, then it'll just display, hey, I found this device. This is the temperature and this is the humidity. And that's oh, okay. it. Okay. Okay. So almost like a JSON, but for Bluetooth yeah. type thing. Okay. So like, exactly. all right, I gotcha. Wow, that's so cool. That seems like such an easy way to jump in and try it out. Like, let's exactly, advertise yeah. some data. I mean, like, hey, why not? Let me throw it in there, you know? Okay, so now I'm curious. So, so what's the next step then? What if, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm curious what the next step would be there. So that's advertising. And I absolutely love that use case because I feel like there's a ton of use cases for yeah. that. Like, I feel like that's just this vast array of, I just need to know something, you know? Exactly. So I'm curious what the next step is. So, what, what's the so yeah, devices. So devices that need bi-directional data transfer. So say, for example, a wearable device or a medical device that maybe needs to, you be, you have to control it, for example, and the data is also it needs to be secure. There are some added functionality or features in the latest spec, which is 5.4, to actually encrypt the advertising data but it still requires to go through a connection, establish some authenticity, authentication in order to be able to decrypt the data that's in the advertising. But in any case, the devices that need either bi-directional data transfer or they need to be to have a lot more security, they will need to go into connection mode. Also connection mode, and this might be a little bit counterintuitive, can actually save you power because you can sleep longer and you can also, the, it, there are parameters, there are a lot of parameters in Bluetooth Low Energy that allow you to kind of fine tune the protocol and the, to your application. That's why it's really become a lot more flexible. It's more of a multi-tool that you can use to accomplish different things. And it, the parameters that are available for you to, to fine tune are the ones that make it powerful and flexible. So the central device that we talked about, once it discovers an advertising device that's sending out this advertising data every so often, if the advertising packet type that that advertiser is sending out accepts connections, the central device, the phone usually, will send a connection request packet or connection, uh, they call it connection indication packet. Basically, that's telling the advertiser that I want to connect now. And once connected, they basically the two devices agree on a specific connection interval at which they wake up and exchange data, and then they go back to sleep. And it's very precise. So they don't really have a way of waking up each other. It's more based on a time-based uh, communication. So the clocks are very accurate to a certain degree that where there's just a little bit of margin of error, and the devices, the radios will wake up at a window so that they can catch each other. But really, the central device and the peripheral then wake up at exactly, almost exactly the same time, exchange data, go back to sleep, and wake up at the next connection interval, exchange data, and so on. No kidding. Okay, so the individual device clock mm -hmm. is what, so they, so when they go through that connection process, they're like, three, two, one, now. And yeah. like, that's the point in time, and then that's going to be the, so I mean, that does seem like, so you can't have some like, 
clock that's going to wander off. You're going to have all types of issues, yeah. right? It needs to be really precise there. Okay. Wow. That is fascinating. So interesting. Okay. All right. I feel like I interrupted you there. So, okay. So they, <laughs> so they, they say, all right, we are now connected. Now, is that, does that part of the authentication or that's really just getting the timing? Yeah. Part? So, yeah. So that's just getting the timing. There's really no mandation or requirement for authentication between devices. So with low, with Bluetooth Low Energy, you have the flexibility again. Flexibility is kind of the key here. Some applications, you don't really care about security. You don't need to encrypt the data. So you don't want to waste time doing that. And also that requires like processing overhead on the devices on both ends and having crypto libraries available so you can encrypt the data, decrypt in a certain amount of time and sometimes hardware accelerated. Anyway, so some applications, it doesn't really matter that much. So you can save the cost of having to do that in terms of time and even money because some chipsets uh, will be more expensive because they support that. And so the connection, the authentication will happen usually after a connection. And just to kind of give you an overview, like we said the in the advertising data state, there's only advertising data that's being sent out. Now, there, that's only like 31 bytes. You can do something called a scan request and scan response, which allows you to send an extra packet. But that's just not enough sometimes. Uh, so even if you are just broadcasting data, that might not be enough. With connection mode, you actually get this definition of a structure of the data. So you can structure your own data in a, like a hierarchy into what's called services and characteristics. So usually the peripheral is the device that has that. It's called the, this is called the GAT layer or a generic attribute profile. And this GAT defines like the services and characteristics. So an example would be like, say you have a device that just needs to, it's serving as like a weather station. So it has different parameters. So you can have a weather station service and underneath that you have different characteristics. One of them could be the humidity, the temperature, the uh, air pressure and for all for each of these characteristics they'll have a value and that value is holding you know whatever the device updates it to be ref to reflect the reading from its sensors now that serves as the gap server and you can have multiple services so a standard one there are standard ones from the sig so from the bluetooth sig that you can use and leverage and usually the the bluetooth stacks and the libraries will already implement this and like, for example, the battery level service is a very common one. So that's already provided there. So you, with one API, you can probably just add that to your device. And that'll become like the second service maybe on that device. The And in addition to the weather station service, you have a battery service. Underneath the battery service, you'll have a battery level characteristic. So that holds the percentage maybe of your battery. So that defines a structure. And then... The, based on the specification, the other device also, you know, was programmed to the stack, was compliant with the specs for the specification. So it has, it can do certain operations on that device. So on the GAT server. So it's called the GAT client. The central is called the GAT client in most cases. The peripheral is called the GAT server. The GAT server just basically opens up its data or the its structure of the data that it holds. And then the GAT client will send like a read operation or the, if, if the characteristic allows the write operation for like controlling the device or setting some kind of setting or configuration, then it will allow a write configuration. But the reason I talk about that also is that's where the security usually gets implemented is you secure the access to these characteristics at different levels. So you could have the battery level being, maybe it doesn't matter. I don't care if anybody can connect me, to me and read the battery level, but I don't want them to read the temperature or, or the humidity level or anything like that. So I can restrict access and require authentication and encryption for reading any of the other characteristics. Okay. All right. So really like if it's going to take processing power, it makes sense to limit the use where necessary. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Okay. So just let me do a quick read back, make sure I'm following. So the central device would be called the GAT client. And In most cases, it's yeah. okay. All right. And then it would reach out to some peripheral, which would be the GAT peripheral. 
and that peripheral is the one that's like providing the services and all that type of stuff. And then the client is able to interact with. So like this, to me, all these words sound very familiar with a Wi-Fi implementation to me, you know, when Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about like client and server type thing, at least in some of the libraries that I've been using, specifically like the ESP32 library, you know, they're, they're using a lot of that similar language, which makes it really nice to be able to just mentally kind of think about that. So I'm curious, like in some of these implementations, like the higher level library that might be used, are are they allowing, do they let people set their own, design their own structures or is like designing structures really difficult thing and super technical and it's not worth managing or is it? No, it's, it's, yeah, the, the, the purpose, the goal of that in Bluetooth low energy is to overcome a lot of the use, the limitations from classic. So they provide the flexibility, the customization for the developer or the manufacturer of a device to define that structure. So usually the APIs will allow you to add services, add your own custom services, or even add the Bluetooth sake adopted services or characteristics. And those really provide a level of interoperability. So between devices. So if, if I develop an app and you are, you have your own device and we never communicated about what the data structure would look like, but if you're using a battery level or battery service from the SIG and I am implementing a client for battery, then I can immediately be able to read that regardless of me not knowing or not communicating with you beforehand on the compliance. Okay. That. So that's, that's where the SIG adopted profile all right. come in. That's totally awesome. Okay. I think it sort of makes sense. This is a lot, man. Like yeah. you, <laughs> this is a lot to know. Like that, I'm taking away that, wow, there are so many layers to uh, Bluetooth. It's so fun to be able to grab onto a high level library though, and just use it. You know, yeah. it's pretty uh, empowering. That's pretty awesome. You know, we've been talking about like the, uh, the batteries and the power a little bit mm-hmm. here. Um, and I'm just kind of curious. So like you said, you can define, you can really get it pretty low. And I, I just anecdotally, I can say that I feel like my Bluetooth devices are lasting a lot longer than they used to. Is that a trend you think is going to continue or are we kind of like, have, are we at the limit at this point? And like, I don't know. No, I, I mean, yeah, there's uh I don't know about battery, like in a lot of cases, uh, if it's a Bluetooth classic device, there's there is a limit uh, already. Uh, and maybe they last longer, maybe they started including like they, they have more be- better power optimization techniques. But I, I don't think it uh, applies to the radio or the, the protocol itself. Bluetooth classic basically has not much changed much since maybe 2012 or 2014. So that didn't really apply. Now, if you talk about Bluetooth low energy devices, then there are a lot of different features that are getting added to help with optimizing the power even more. But really the the main, the biggest part of power optimization comes from tuning the BLE parameters. So the connection interval, the size of the data, the way you you compress the data somehow in a format that doesn't use up much radio on time, um, that, really is the biggest factor with those devices is it's all about how much the radio is on is turned on versus turned off gotcha so you have a lot of control you there's a lot of yeah. little switches you can move to kind of say like okay uh worst case best case even you know a kind of thing yeah. like you know all right wow that's okay very interesting so man i uh i feel like i've just gotten a master class in bluetooth right now it's just like really awesome i can't wait to go like start using it probably uh like i yeah. mentioned before i feel like an esp32 is a great place uh or you mentioned the arduino nano ble uh 33, 33. um yeah. those are neat little boards tiny little boards that BLE enabled on there. That's pretty sweet. What I need to make sure that I'm doing though, is like the libraries I'm going to be using, they're going to differentiate between like classic and BLE. Like these are two separate beasts, you know, it's like, it's it's for some purposes. Yeah. I I was looking it up and uh, there is a specific library called Arduino BLE. So you can just use that and you'll, you'll know. I, I don't think actually the later versions of the Bluetooth, the, the ESP 32, support classic anymore i think they're moving away from that like the latest version i i I just posted something on linkedin the other the other day and it was on uh, a new esp32 and it has uh, 
actually the, just this last night I posted something and it's about a new ESP32 that supports 802.15.4, which is Thread and Matter and Zigbee, as well as Bluetooth Low Energy. So, uh, and that doesn't support Classic. The trend is is with the whole IoT Internet of Things is that Classic doesn't get used in that. Um, classic is more about audio applications, audio streaming. So it, it doesn't make sense to keep including it because it's also a power hog. And if you don't know, if you accidentally turn it on or keep it on, it, it's just going to drain your power. And there's just not many use cases for smaller devices that need to consume less power. They need to run on batteries and they need to be smaller in size as well and more efficient. It, Bluetooth low energy is, is the way to go. Okay. Wow. All right. Don't take your boxing gloves off or anything, man. I... <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this is a little bit out in left field, maybe. I have heard of things called Bluetooth sniffers. I don't know what that means. Is that just a device yeah. that scans for Bluetooth stuff, like you mentioned, like on the, like on the phone, yeah. or is that something different? So, yeah. So, the, so the device, the the apps on the phone are usually more in the active state, so they they can initiate a connection. Um, I, I obviously, in the receiving side of just uh, scanning for advertising, it's not really doing much. It's just listening, so it's really passive. But where Bluetooth sniffers come in is there, there are different types. There are cheap ones that are based on just Bluetooth development kits that are available, and they usually integrate with Wireshark to show you the traffic. So basically, it's a way for you to see the traffic in a passive sense. But it's not only, it's, it's looking at all the different data, but it's also recording a log. So you, you can see the past. With these apps, for example, if you search for something, it's only going to show you the latest packet that was received. If you need a log and you need to look back in history, you need to look at the data, how it changed. You need to look at what devices are now out there versus before, the, like a few minutes ago, they weren't out there. But it goes beyond that because now, this can actually uh, sniff the packets between two connected devices. So when you have your phone connected to your Fitbit, I can run a Bluetooth sniffer, and if it catches the connectivity, the connection request, the connection request is a very special packet because it contains all the parameters that define the timing for when the devices need to wake up. And there's also hopping on different frequencies that happens in Bluetooth Low Energy that also allows it to coexist with the other millions of devices uh, or uh, on other protocols in the same uh, wireless spectrum. So it's immune to a lot of these uh, co coexistence issues and RF noise. If you capture that packet, the sniffer now knows, oh, I need to wake up at this specific time and on this frequency so I can see what's being transmitted and transferred between these two devices specifically. Okay. Wow. So it's... It's really powerful in helping you debug if you have issues because sometimes your your phone maybe you, you're using like off the shelf app you don't know much about what's happening under uh, underneath you have your device your device thinks that it's transmitting something or you are you know you put some kind of data the sniffer will tell you exactly what is actually going over the air and that way you can make sure that the device is is working as it's supposed to, or you can take you know the what you find out and blame your mobile app developer and tell them that, that you know they're not doing their job right. Um, <laughs> but that's that it's really like the the a reference to tell you what's going on over the air, uh, looking at uh, transmission errors or packet errors. So it's like Wireshark is used for sniffing or for doing like a lot of network analytics on, uh, on like traffic, uh, IP traffic. So uh, I've used it in the past uh, a long time ago for like analyzing like HTTP requests and get requests and all that. But it also has now support for basically parsing Bluetooth low energy packets. And so the sniffer will basically capture those packets, put it in a format that Wireshark understands, and then Wireshark will display the data at the different levels with all the different raw um, bytes that inc are included in those uh, packets. Wow, that's really cool. Now I totally want one. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's pretty cheap. Like uh, Nordic has uh, one called the NRF52840 USB dongle. It's a very small USB dongle. It costs $10 and you can just plug it into your PC and it works across Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. 
And you just need to install Wireshark and do a little bit of uh, installation for uh, the dongle itself to get the software to run. And then you can open it up in Wireshark and run it and see all the devices around you. Wow, that is so cool. Man, I, we have covered so much, Muhammad. I, I do have one more question, though. If you'll, if you, you've been very generous with your time, I really appreciate this. And I don't even know. Maybe there's, maybe there's nothing to this. But we mentioned the communication modes for Bluetooth so mm -hmm. far. We talked about when the peripherals and advertising mode, and then we talked about when the peripheral and the central are in connection mode. Are there other modes that I sh that are pertinent, or are those kind of the two main ones? No, th those are the two main ones. Uh, with LE Audio, there is a new mode that's uh, like to handle audio streams. So there's a, what's called the broadcast isochronous stream. Uh, and that the term isochronous, uh, it, it's all about the time of the, the data, the time validity and uh, how long it's valid for and making sure. And that's to address all the streaming use cases. So that's a different level. So for example... Like you'll have in the future, some of the use cases of like LE audio is to have like all these TVs in the gym, for example, are usually silent and the bars usually silent. You don't hear them. You just see the sub to the captions. Now you, you with LE audio, it's going to enable you to tune into a specific TV with your earbuds, with your standard Bluetooth earbuds that support LE audio. And uh, that technology is being uh, branded as AuraCast is the name of it. There's more information on the Bluetooth uh, web website, the Bluetooth SIG website. So that in that mode, the device will be in what's called the broadcast isochronous kind of mode. Uh, so it's not using the regular advertising data and it's not really in connection mode. So it's using a new kind of mode. Okay. Uh, that's only, currently it's going to be mostly for LE Audio. However, the foundation that actually LE Audio built up upon those isochronous channels uh, can be used for like streaming sensor data or providing like information that's continuously changing and that's only valid for a specific period of time. And you can leverage that for other applications outside of just audio stream. Okay. Wow. That's so cool. It's like a lot of new stuff still coming down the yeah. pipe, you know, it's like not, uh, not done at all yet. That's really neat. So when two devices are in connection mode and they're talking back and forth, can either one be like, we're good, I'm done, and break the connection? Yeah. So yeah. either one can yeah. initiate that? Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. There, I mean, there's so many different use cases or cases in which scenarios in which that happens. So you could lose power on one of the devices. Or they can go out of range. Usually if it goes out of range, then the device that went out of range or whatever, either device is not going to send that terminate a connection packet because it's just physically out of range. Um, so there's a timeout there for each device where it determines, okay, I'm not, I haven't gotten packets in the last few seconds or whatever. Uh, you define that timeout as well. Um, you say the connection is lost. And if it's the advertising device, then maybe it just goes back to uh, the peripheral device just goes back to advertising again. The central device might go, just go back to scanning again. Oh, wow. So there's even like a, yeah, I'm trying to think of the word yeah. for that. You know what I mean? But like a safety safety mode yeah. or whatever. Okay. Wow. A fallback method. That's so cool. So I feel like from experience, a client, a GAT client can have multiple connected, multiple peripherals. Um, could, yeah. And maybe you kind of already talked about this already, but can a GAT server have mm -hmm. multiple clients? That's yes. also capable. All right. And that's not in it. And that's not an advertising mode that would be in connection mode or so, so the, 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 the GAT server is in, uh, you know, that only applies when you're in connection because there's no, oh, okay. in yeah. advertising mode, you're just, the advertising device, the peripheral is just sending out data. There's no real structure behind it because there's no way for the other device to interact with it. Basically. Right. Okay. Gotcha. So in connection mode. Uh, but the spec actually does not define a maximum number of roles that a device can hold. So I can have a device that's advertising the whole time and even it can accept a connection and still be advertising and accept another connection and still be advertising. In the end, you're going to be limited by how much time is available for you to, to maintain the connection with another device and be able to satisfy the requirements for that. And also the memory might be a limitation, resources might be a limitation. But there's like, for example, the Nordic uh, platform 
they're, they, I think they allow up to 20 simultaneous connections from a small device. So wow, you can crazy. be central, uh, peripheral, and you can be a combination, any combination of those in 20, in 20 different ones with other devices. The problem becomes is if you have to manage the timing uh, correctly. Otherwise, right. one is going to drop or one is going to go, uh, you know, and, and just get time out. Okay. That's fascinating. All right. I promise you. La last last question. Here. Take your time. Uh, Distance-wise, like let's say I'm, I'm trying to mm -hmm. figure out like, okay, well, what's an appropriate distance at which to use BLE? Are there like, is there just like a set distance like this is the distance or is that a hardware dependent thing or is that like a is there are there any switches i can adjust in my yeah in my code to help uh you know increase decrease etc yeah so at the basic the most basic level you have uh transmit power which allows you to increase the transmit power on your device so that it can you know the signal is going to go further and it'll be able to the receiver will be able to interpret that correctly without any corruption at a longer distance. Uh, antenna design is really crucial for these devices, especially in the end product format. Um, so usually like if it's something that needs to ach achieve a long range, then it will have like an external antenna. But then you have other parameters come into play, uh, including like there's a new feature that was introduced in the 5.0 Bluetooth version 5.0 called coded phi and or long range mode in uh, generic terms. And basically what that does, it, it allows you to increase the range of a Bluetooth low energy device um, or the packets and the, the, the signals that are coming out, the, the traffic, and without increasing the transmit power. And the way it does that, it adds like redundancy. It uses what's called forward air correction or FEC. It's a mechanism for kind of like adding redundancy in the data in the packets so that on the receiver end, even if it finds some errors, it can kind of recover the data based on the redundancy of that packet and of the data in that packet. So it allows it to go a much longer distance. Obviously, with anything in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, water is the biggest obstacle and the most uh, the one that's going to attenuate your signal the most. So even humans, you know, we're 70% water in our bodies. So if I place the device on either side, like the back and front, they can think based on the received signal strength that they're like 10 meters apart, whereas they're really just a few, a few centimeters apart. Um, so it, that affects things. But with long range mode, there's actually, they have been tests that were done uh, by the vendor companies that achieved over one kilometer of range, but that's line of sight and it's outdoors um, using Bluetooth Low Energy. Actually, one of my uh, like courses that I cover in my Bluetooth Developer Academy, it was cover specifically focused on coded phi, and uh, I cover I I tested it on different platforms like ESP32 was one of them, uh, Nordic was one of them, and what I did to test this out, um, I had to find a, so the problem with long range mode is that the phones do not support it most of the time, especially iOS does not support it at all. If you want to look for a phone that actually supports it, uh, your best bet is uh, a OnePlus phone or a Samsung phone usually. Uh, I think the pixels are, are becoming more uh, supported uh, with, with for long range. But what I did is I ran one of these generic apps like the NRF Connect uh, app on my phone, a phone that, a OnePlus phone that supports long range. And I attached the, multiple development kits, uh, the ESP32 and the, the Nordic one to a drone. And I flew it <laughs> as far as I could. And I just recorded like the, the screen on my, um, I both recorded the video from the drone, obviously, and I can see the distance uh, from the controller. But then on my, on another, on that phone, I can see what the RSSI looks like and how far the distance, the, the signal was, was still being received. I think it was like 300, 400 meters in my use case. But I was like on, on the ground and the drone was much higher. And then, you know, this is using just the development kit. So it's not using wow. an external antenna. That's awesome. That man. was a pretty I, cool test. Yeah. Hey, I feel like this is a good segue too to talk a little bit about Novel Bits and uh, the Bluetooth Low Energy Academy. Because yeah. you teach you te all the stuff that you've just been talking about, you teach in depth in your training program, in your training academy. Um, who's like the ideal person for, for checking this out and, and uh, getting set up? 
Yeah, so I mean, for, for somebody just getting started, I, I recommend starting with something like a book. Um, I, I have a book that's out, uh, that's available for free on the website, but there's a new version coming out. So that's available for pre-order at the moment. Uh, it's really a very gentle intro to Bluetooth Low Energy. So it covers a lot of the stuff that we talked about today. In the new version, it's going to cover more practical stuff as well with uh, actual development. But that's like, and it's also available on Amazon um, as a paperback if you're interested in that. And that gives you a gentle introduction to Bluetooth Low Energy. And you don't need to know anything really technical to get started with that. So that's like the first, um, that's what I recommend that people start off with. And if you want to go deeper, the Academy, the my membership is what includes uh, a lot of the different courses that go in depth on different topics. And uh, we're continuously adding courses. We started doing live workshops as well, where uh, me and uh, one other person get on the a call. We cover a specific topic, but it's really open for people to come on screen or just audio and ask questions, uh, engage in a discussion. Um, a lot of the, the courses will have source code that's available to download. There's also part of that is the community, the forum, where people can ask questions about the courses or even specific technical questions about their own projects that they're working on. Uh, so that's ideal more for somebody who's actively working on a product. Um, now, it could, be, it could be an entrepreneur working on their own product that BLE is a central part of it. Um, they need to get that working right. And uh, we have actually have one of our members who is by, uh, by trade, is not a programmer at all. And uh, he just started, he, he now has a product out in the market, actually, that's a, a trumpet that's using Bluetooth low energy to transmit the uh, MIDI uh, uh, type format of, uh, of signals and, uh, and packets to uh, a PC or a phone. And you'll be able to uh, play music also, uh, play from that digital trumpet, basically. It's not a real trumpet. It's with buttons, and it has an LCD screen. It runs a, uh, I think it, it even uses an ESP32 uh, oh, wow, in it cool. for the BLE. And uh, it's actually out in the market. Um, I forget the, the name of it. It's uh, Digibrass, I think, is the name of the company, um, or maybe the name of the, 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 t the product itself. Uh, I forget which one it was. Yeah, Digibrass Tilt, that's the name of the product. So, And he's a, he's been a member for a long time of the Academy. He progressed through building a prototype of the device all the way to taking it to production and selling it in the market right wow, now. Wow, that is awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, we will, uh, and for anybody who's interested listening, we will make sure to have a link in the description for Novel Bits and the uh, the Training Academy and, and probably the book. We'll probably page a uh, link in there too for the book. I know I've got it. It's cool. uh it's cool. So sweet, man. Mohammed, thank you so much for yeah, thank spending you. Thank so you much Mike. time with us, man. I fun. feel like this was just fantastic. I know I've walked away from this feeling a lot more confident about diving into Bluetooth. I feel like just having some of that jargon, some of those words, yeah, understood a little bit. It just I've I don't know, it gives me a it's the biggest obstacle, really. In. Yeah. So yeah. awesome. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it.